All right, that works. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I think you'll notice that the talk's in English. I hope that's okay. I don't speak Bulgarian, and my Dutch will probably be incomprehensible as my German and French. So we'll stick to English. Um, the talk will be quite technical. Uh, it's about a project I did at my university to uh, get some grades instead of doing some uh, optional courses. And this was uh, a lot more fun. So uh, it's called Tracy. Um, and it basically, it's a library to uh, trace and inject system calls, which might sound very technical, but I'll uh, start with some uh, background and motivation for the project. Um, then I'll speak about some features that the library has and, and what you can do with it. Um, I'll discuss some implementation details. This, this is quite technical, but uh, all the other parts should be quite easy to follow, I hope. Um, I'll discuss some future applications because it's a library and we want to do stuff with it. And finally, some future work for the project. Okay, so first of all, what we wanted to make is a, a library that you can use to uh, trace system calls. Uh, on most Linux architectures out there, and eventually also BSD. Um, but this is, turns out to be quite hard because the main interface to uh, debug uh, processes is called ptrace. And it's not cross-platform and it's not cross-architecture. It's implemented in most of the platforms and architectures, but in a different way. And obviously, uh, some different computers have uh, different registers, like your smartphone is a different CPU than your laptop, most probably. Um, so that makes it quite hard to uh, get all the values right. And on top of that, uh, Linux and, and BSD also differ in, in the ptrace API. So it's not, you can't write a simple C program that will just use ptrace and then be able to debug all the processes. Um, so a few possible use cases for the library to show you what, what you can do with it. And then I'll discuss how it works. So you can do jailing uh, on a process-based level. So what you could do is you could look at what files the process opens, what kind of network connection it makes, and disallow them or, or rewrite them or change them so you can uh, effectively make it open a different file or tell the process that the file isn't there even though the file is there and the process won't notice. You can do uh, routing of I.O. You can send all the circuit traffic over a, a proxy. Uh, you can do some nice debugging with it, visualization of system calls, replaying certain system calls that might be interesting for reverse engineering as well. Uh, you can do fault injection, which is uh, simulate errors in your program. For example, simulate that the disk is full, and then see how your program reacts to the disk being full, because this is not something that happens very often, so your program might crash if you didn't write it properly. And you can do lots of logging as well. OK, so a very basic um, a system call is uh, it's the fundamental interface between uh, an application and the kernel. So if you want to interact with hardware, then you need a system call. If you want to open, uh, if you want to mount a hard disk, if you want to write to a hard disk, if you want to start a new process, if you want to open a file, if you want to chat with a process, you need a system call. Um, and a system call is uh, just a way to talk to the kernel and you tell the kernel that you want it to do something by either uh, executing a special instruction or uh, equivalently uh, an interrupt, depending on your platform. For example, uh, there's the open system call, which you use to open a file. Uh, then with whatever open returns, you can write to a file. You can uh, create a socket. You can fork, which is duplicate my process and then do something else with it. Or you can uh, wait on uh, specific signals of a process. And there's lots of other system calls. But these are basic common ones. So I mentioned ptrace already. It means process, process trace. It doesn't mean POSIX trace, which would imply that the API is sort of sane and shared, which is it's not. So it doesn't mean POSIX. Um, and as I said, it has no uniform API. Um, and with ptrace, there's basically two ways to debug processes. You can either trap on every uh, instruction, which is every uh, assembly instruction executed, which is quite slow, because every time uh, you're debugging a process, the kernel has to stop the process. It will tell you, hey, it executed one instruction, and then you can do whatever you want with the instruction, uh, sorry, with the process, and then you can let it continue to the next instruction. But this is very, very, very slow. So I think it will be at least uh, a thousand times slower, probably more, because you, the CPU has to do a lot of context switches and move your process in, on, onto the CPU and the other one out of the CPU. So that's 
uh, not viable in this case, and we don't need it because ptrace also allows us to just uh, trap on system calls and signals, which means then that whenever your uh, the, pro the process you're debugging performs a system call, so performs the ensemble instruction to says, hey, I want to do a system call, or it receives a signal, which is, uh, yeah, signals are just unique signals. Um, and then it's also, the process is also stopped, and you can do whatever you want with it, and then have it resume or not, if you, want, if you wish to. Um, OK. And Tracy uses Ptrace on every platform that we support, uh, because Ptrace is the way to debug processes. And Tracy is not a Ptrace replacement, but it uses Ptrace to give you a nicer API to debug stuff. OK, so like I said, it allows us to uh, trap on system call instructions. Uh, and when the process is stopped that we're debugging, we can do anything with it. We can change the memory contents. We can look at the CPU registers that we're allowed to access. Uh, so does the process. Uh, we can change them, um, which means we can change a lot. We can change the arguments to a system call. We can change the system call number, which is uh, a number in the register that defines which system calls to be executed. For example, read could be zero, uh, number one, write could be number two, and you can just change them, and then the process will execute a different system call. Um, we can also control the signals sent to the program. We can change signal numbers, which is funny, but I don't, didn't find a good use for it yet. And uh, obviously, we can spawn new processes or already trace new processes created by the process we're debugging because that's quite useful if a program creates a new program then you also want to debug that one or not but we can do that okay so i'll just open all the features um like i said well ptrace is event-based because you're waiting on a process to do something for example a system call and then uh, you can change the, the, the process. So Tracy is obviously also event-based. You can say, hey, I want to uh, hook on a specific system call, in this case, a read. And then whenever the read system call is executed on a process, Tracy will invoke the function called readhook uh, with the, the ID of the stop process and some other information. I can, you, you can just do whatever you want with the process. Um, so a very nifty feature uh, we build in, apart from just tracing system calls, is that you can inject system calls, which means that the, the process is stopped. And for example, it was trying to open a file, but meanwhile, you wanted it to uh, do something else, like create a network socket. Now, when the process is stopped at a system call, you can just change the system call number. You can change the argument, say, hey, I want you to create a socket. And then you can have the program uh, execute this uh, uh, system call without the process finding out that it has executed the system call. I mean, you can figure out if you try really hard, but the idea is that it's transparent. So what, what, what we'll do is we'll, we change some numbers, and we uh, perform the system call, and then uh, the pro 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 program will resume with its open system call, or whatever it was doing before. Um, we also have an uh, API to uh, access memory in a fast way because the Linux kernel, I think, now offers three ways to read the memory, and some of, some of them are supported, some are not, and some are very slow, and some are fast but very recent. Um, and we support uh, the two Intel instru uh, 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 instruction sets and the ARM instruction set, which is what all your smartphones and uh, embedded uh, machines run. And there's some experimental bindings for Python, but I think, I think they're broken right now because of some recent code rewrite. OK, so uh, just terminology, a tracy is a program that, that is being traced, so a process that we are debugging. And a tracer is, for example, what tracy is doing. It's tracing a process. So even though tracy sounds the same as tracy, it is, in fact, not the tracy. It's a tracer. OK, um, performs a system call. It will stop the program before it uh, executes a system call and after it has executed the system call, which means that you can, uh, first of all, inspect, for example, if a process is performing the open, open system call, you can see what file it's opening and in what mode. And uh, after it has opened the file or not, you can read the return code and you can see, okay, so this file descriptor was returned or this was the error because the file was not found or whatever, you don't have permissions. Um, so what we do to inject system calls is we first of all look in which state we are. So if we're before the system call, we have to do something different than if we're after the system call, because we, we uh, allowed you to inject. So um, 
but it's typically like this. So the programmer tries to perform a system call, uh, a system call number, we can uh, image switch users. And when the system, uh, system behaves, this is our own system call, we're injecting it, go ahead, we stop the getting our system call, and then we can restore uh, the and uh, state. Injection, we differentiate between two. You can do a synchronous injection and asynchronous injection. We'll uh, inject the system call and beat until the... This might not be very nice if you're tracing and merge operation. Then uh, you don't actually don't return immediately. And when the, uh, the system call is actually finished, it will call your function. And then you can do whatever you want. So this is the uh, injection. If you execute a system call but hasn't yet registered before, then we can change uh, and then we will restore whatever the result of our injected system call is. Then we will modify the instruction pointer or program counter, which is basically the, the number that will tell the CPU what instruction, uh, um, because we've just executed the system, we'll have to jump back some bytes to the call, execute the system call. And then no registers. Okay, so I briefly different way using ptrace, uh, writing and reading a text map. Uh, Peter is also a system call in virtual file system which basically contains process information and some, some other information and each process uh, identified by PID which is a process ID and number of your, your program running uh, has a special mem file which is obviously not created by the program but options which you have if you're tracing a program. So this is also you can write megabytes at once if you want. And uh, enough. Um, and there's Okay, so there's some techniques to share some of your own memory. So memory that you can some string tries to open, but if you wanted to open a different file in the tracy, you change the system of arguments and uh, yeah. The memory is read only for the tracy and read write for us because then we can change it. Uh, another problem we ran into uh, when we were trying to add BSD support, we haven't finished this yet, but we're still working on it, is that um, if you uh, create a new process so if you're tracing a process, which is done very often, and it's in fact the only way to process, then um, you, you just uh, that if you're trying the jail process, it's to make sure that the new process could remove some stuff, then you can't, you know, like six years. Uh, it's originally wrote in Linux, but it should work. Um, you just create a new, new uh, program, and then the program is created, and at some point you will receive the ID of the newly created program, and then you can do whatever you want with it. The problem is that if you create a new program, it will already start running, and it's not guaranteed that you will get the number of the program before it's actually running. So it can do, like I said, lots of uh, nasty stuff. So our idea was that we would create some controlled environment where the fork system call will be executed, and then both, the both programs will do absolutely nothing, and we can then just wait until at some point we get the number of the new process, which is usually quite very fast, but... Um, and then we can take those two programs out of the uh, controlled environment again and put them back where they were running originally. So basically we're creating some safe jump where the programs will run indefinitely and do absolutely nothing and then we place them back at the original point and then we are already tracing both the programs. So, uh, it's, in code it looks very simple. So the idea is that uh, the, fork system, the fork system call is executed. So then we go from one process to two processes and they're running at the same time. Um, then the number uh, will be sent by the, by, the, by the parent at some point when it's resumed, so we get the PID number. Uh, the child will not do this, so it will just end up going in a loop, performing the scheduled system call, which means do nothing, let other processes do stuff. Um, so what will happen, say the, the parent creates a process, the child is already running, it's faster, the scheduler said, hey, the child is nicer, go and do something. Uh, the child will just keep running in the scheduled uh, loop and it can't do anything and it, I mean the original program isn't even being resumed, it's just staying there. And the parent will end up there as well but it will then send us the number of the child so then we can attach to the child and safely uh, put it back at the original place. Okay, so there was another uh, big problem that we ran into and we originally didn't solve it but I recently coded quite some stuff in to be able to cope with it. And the problem is that Linux supports multiple ABIs. And an ABI is an application binary interface, which basically defines how you pass your uh, system call numbers, uh, what the system call numbers mean, and, and how you execute them. So the instruction determines the ABI, which kind of makes sense. For example, the, the, the new Intel processors running AMD 46, uh, 64, 
Um, they support the, the old 32-bit uh, processes as well, so all the old instructions are also supported. And if a, if a program runs in 64-bit mode, it can still execute 32-bit uh, instructions. So if you execute a 32-bit instruction as a 64-bit program, then the uh, system call numbers have a different meaning, which means that, uh, yeah, so the, the system call numbers are different for uh, 64 and 32-bit. And it's very hard to determine uh, if the process is, is in 64 32-bit uh, mode doing a system call. Um, so the, there's another register that also has an effect, the code segment register, but I'll not go into that. Um, and like I said, processes can mix the ABIs at runtime, which is really, really bad. And it's really hard to debug, debug this. And Astray does it wrong. Oh, something I didn't mention before, but it might be interesting. Uh, for the whole safe work problem, uh, if you read the Astrace manual page, uh, Astrace is a program that will allow you to trace system calls. Um, Astrace is literally puts in the manual page, so we don't know when the child types to the child, but it can do lots of stuff, some calls are executed. This is very, very useful, and it's a very nice program. I'm happy that it exists, but the code is absolutely terrible. Um, it's quite large, 20, 25,000 lines of code, um, and all the C files uh, are just large files for all the architectures mashed together, so there's no file for, uh, air, uh, for Intel instruction sets. Okay, so this is an example program <coughs> which is compiled as a 64-bit program, and what it does, it will simply uh, uh, call a system call, in this case uh, using the Intel instruction for a 32-bit uh, process, which means uh, the system call numbers will be different and it will just execute uh, a system call, which is one of the most simple system calls, give me my process number. And Astrace will see something completely different. And this is the output of Astrace, which is basically uh, a wrong system call number, and you can see it gets lots of errors because it tries to read addresses that don't exist, and yeah, it goes pretty bad. Uh, Tracy does it properly, so it does detect that. In fact, we are seeing a get pit function. Um, so this is something I should probably file a bug with them, and I, I know how to fix it, so I might just file a patch. Um, so the clue here is that the system call uh, number 20 is a get pit on 32-bit systems, but on 64-bit systems is the right fee system call. And Astray didn't detect that it's in a different mode, so I just thought, hey, it's right key. A problem here is that uh, right now change the, uh, the system construction we're trying to read. So in this case, it can change it from a 64 to 30-bit instruction, then we have a problem. Um, this is something I haven't solved yet. So if there's a malicious program out there, it can still uh, fool Tracy. But in, you won't find that quite often, I think. <laughs> um, so an idea here would be to make the memory uh, either readable and executable or writable, which means that you can't execute and write to the memory at the same time. Then a thread is unable to change the memory when you're in fact, uh, when another thread's executing it. But this is very hard and, and, and will take a lot of code. And I tried to keep Tracy relatively simple. So we didn't implement this yet. Okay, so um, an application for tracing is uh, something we call Soxy. Uh, it's a transparent proxifier using SOX5, and SOX5 is, a, as you might have guessed, a, a, a protocol to, to proxy stuff. And it's like TSOX or TORSOX. So the idea is that you open a connection to a proxy server, you send some magic bytes saying, hey, this is me, and this is my authentication, and I want to send lots of uh, data to, to the socket. And then once that's done, you can just send uh, socket data like it's normal uh, socket, so then the the connection, it isn't clear that you're talking to a proxy because the only difference is in the initial state and then you can just send all your data. So this is very nice if, uh, for example, with TSOX or TORSOX, you want to uh, reroute uh, sockets and internet traffic. Um, so there's this thing called LDP loads. I'll get back to <laughs> SOXY in a second. And what it basically does is, um, this is what TSOX and TORSOX use. The idea is that to hook into a program, um, 
you have to uh, insert some library so you can override their uh, read and write and socket system calls so you can catch whatever they're trying to do with the network and uh, put it through a proxy first. So to do this, TSOX and TORSOX use LD preload and what it basically does, it loads their own library uh, on top of uh, libc and it overrides whatever you want to override and then afterwards you can uh, call the libc function. So you can again change, for example, open arguments or uh, socket arguments or any arguments to a, a call in the library. The problem is that uh, if a program uh, directly in, uh, executes uh, in system call instructions, so it doesn't go through a standard C library, then this doesn't work. It doesn't catch anything, it doesn't see anything, so it doesn't work. For normal programs, this works, but if you want to jail stuff or whatever, this is not the, not the solution. Uh, so we try to do the same uh, that Tor Torsox to, does with other preload with Tracy. And Soxy does exactly this. Um, so Soxy is a bit buggy right now because I implemented all the ABI stuff, but uh, it is usable. So the idea is that uh, a program will create a socket and it has some destination address like, hey, I want to connect to this. And um, please create the socket structure for me so I can start sending stuff. So what Soxy will do is it will then uh, suspend the program it will uh, change the socket argument and connect to a proxy server. It will, uh, send, uh, it will inject several system calls, for example. Uh, we'll, we'll write several bytes to say, hey, this is uh, us, we're speaking SOX5, and we'd really like to uh, transfer some data on the socket. And once the initial handshake is complete, then it will uh, return uh, to the original program and return a socket structure that does the proper thing. Uh, and then the program could just do all its read and writes on the socket and it would have never noticed that it's in fact talking through a proxy. And this does not rely on any LD, LD preload hacks and it should be perfectly safe. So you can't break out of it. Okay, I discussed this. Um, so during my bachelor thesis, which had some overlap with this uh, uh, project, I uh, wrote a kernel patch that would really speed, th uh, speed things up because uh, Tracy is definitely slower than, than LD preload and, and those kind of hacks because every time a system call is executed, the process needs to be suspended and the, you can do some stuff with it and then you need to start it again. And there's a huge overhead in doing so because for every system call, the process will be suspended twice and you have to tell it to continue twice which means that there will be at least four context switches, which means that the process running on CPU, it will be taken out of CPU. Your process will be in CPU. You can say, hey, continue, and then uh, you're again taken out of CPU, the debugging process is in there, and then you do the same thing because you have a pre and post system call. This is really, really, really slow. Um, so if you're doing a lot of read system calls, which is common, you'll just read like a thousand bytes. Uh, this becomes very slow. So what I did is I, I wrote a kernel patch for Linux kernel, which will, would allow you to use the ptrace API, which I extended with a few arguments. And um, you will be able to say, OK, so for these system calls, I don't want you to send me a notification, or I do want you to send me a notification of this system call. Um, so, so in this example, it would say, OK, so there's two uh, system calls, read and write. and uh, I don't want you to send any information about these uh, system calls, which means that in fact the, the system calls that are executed very often, uh, you'll get no notification from, of them at all. So if you do this in S-Trace, you'll just simply not see any read or write system calls. And this is a lot faster. Okay, so some future applications. Uh, one of them is buggy. Uh, and this would basically uh, change the uh, results of your system calls and perform fault injection. So again, like I said, you can fake uh, that the disk is full or that you could fake that you're out of memory, which is something that does happen more often. Um, yeah, you can, you can fake broken pipes and, 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 and lots of stuff that can go wrong and lots of stuff does go wrong, but very often programs are simply not suited or they haven't seen all the, the, the problems. Another one is Jelly. Uh, this would be a secure jail. So what you could then do is you, you start a program uh, linked with Tracy, and it would start some program that you want to jail, and then all the, all the system calls are intercepted and changed. For example, you can 
uh, disallow network completely, or you can allow network only to a specific host. You can only you can say, okay, so you can read these files, but you can't write, uh, read the others, and you can't write to them. So in fact, you're making a very small virtual machine uh, without the overhead of loading an entire new kernel, uh, uh, requiring hardware virtualization, stuff like that. That's pretty common. And, and the nice thing is that you don't need to be uh, an administrator or root on the system because you can all do this, you do this as a user. Um, so this is, this is very nice if you, want to, if you have some program that you don't trust but you still want to run it. Uh, you can use uh, Jelly. It doesn't exist yet, exist yet but we're, when I find some time, I'll, I'll work on it. Um, another one is uh, Fuzzy. This is actually the, the program that inspired creating uh, Tracy. I, I wanted to write this program, uh, but then I found that Ptrace really sucked for different platforms. And the idea behind Fuzzy is that uh, we want to emulate Fuse in user space. So I'll briefly explain what, what Fuse is. Fuse is, is, uh, is an a API on Linux where it's a special file that you can use to create file systems as a user, so not as an administrator. And this is very nice. Uh, there's lots of different nice applications for this. For example, there's a uh, file system using SSH. So you can just mount it somewhere and then you have access to a remote server where you have SSH access to. Um, and this is done through the, the dev fuse file. But I've encountered quite some uh, machines, especially in my university, which uh, don't support this, which is really a shame because you're a user, but you can't use it because they didn't enable it in the kernel. So what we wanted to do is we want to uh, track all the system calls of a process or multiple processes. And if they try to open that fuse, we'll just fake like, the, we'll, we'll fake all the interaction with the that fuse file. So then the program thinks that fuse exists, but it actually doesn't exist, but we're implementing all the stuff required in our program, um, which means that outside of whatever we're joining, you can't even see that it's mounted because it's effectively not mounted. But if you do it properly, then all the process that you are tracing will see the fuse file and wherever you mounted something. Uh, and then, in fact, you have, in fact, a fuse as a user without the fuse file. It's uh, quite complicated, but it's just funny. Um, right, and at some point, we might write uh, s -tracy, which is just a proper, uh, proper s -trace. Uh Some future work. I, I mentioned some of these things briefly. Uh, one of them is... Uh, thread-safe ABI detection. Like I said, uh, ABIs are very complicated on Linux. I, I don't even want to talk about BSD because it has uh, some Linux compatibility layer and I, I didn't read into that because I think it will also support all the different uh, architectures that Linux does, or like 64 uh, and 32-bit. Um, but it needs to be thread-safe, so it should be in a sense, so it should be like there's an instruction and we want to read it and it shouldn't be changed by any other thread that we're uh, also tracing. So then we know for sure that this is this ABI that is actually being run. Okay, so there's also some research that I want to do, and that is how cross-platform and cross-architecture actually can become, because at some point it does get quite complicated, and I really hope that we could make a completely cross-platform and uh, cross-architecture library, but it's really hard. For example, I, I mentioned that Soxy was a bit buggy with the new ABI support. One of the problems that you run into is, is if you're running a 64-bit Soxy, and you're tracing uh, some program that will do both 64 and 32 bit system calls, it will try to, for example, allocate a socket, but the, the socket will return a pointer, and the pointer differs per uh, 64 and 32 bit in size. And also, lots of structures differ in size. For example, an integer is, is 8 bytes on 64 bit, or a long is 8 bytes 64 bit, and on uh, 32 bit, that's only 4 bytes. So you'd have to do a lot of hackery to actually uh, re return the proper structures and the proper size, which is exactly what we didn't want because we wanted something that was cross-platform. And you didn't need a lot of quirks to work around different architectures. I think there's something in the kernel, in Linux kernel source code, that does something like this to, to, to uh, support 32-bit and 64-bit, but I, I haven't been able to, f to point, f well, find out what they're doing exactly. Again, time constraints. Um, okay. So I already mentioned safely tracing children on BSD. Uh, we call this safe fork or jumpy. As soon as I get a, a working BSD system again, I'll try to implement this support. Uh, the, the kernel patch is there for speed, but I, I don't think it will be accepted in the main line because there, there have been some patches like this and, and they don't really see the use for, for this kind of APIs, uh, which is a shame. And there's now something different called secure computing, but it's, it's annoying because you can only say, hey, I want to not get a notification for the read uh, system code, but you can't change it at a later time, so it's really sticky, so you can't change it. That's really annoying if you're debugging or, 
only, you only don't want to get rid system calls at some point. And finally, I want to see, which is again similar to research, if I can make some kind of system call intermediate representation, which would be some representation of a system call that would that you can translate to any kind of uh, architecture that is Unix, like like BSD or, or Linux or Solaris. So that means that you won't have several <laughs> open system calls or, or whatever. It's it's kind of a messy. Okay, so I think I'm. Uh, Actually, finishing early, so that's very good news. I hope you will be able to you, was, you were able to follow this. Um, so I wrote this uh, with uh, two friends at the university. The idea was by uh, someone else. Uh, the code is free online; it's GPL licensed. You can find it on GitHub. Uh, we have an IRC channel uh, uh, homepage in the form of a wiki and a mailing list that is not being used very often. Okay, thank you very much. I hope it was a bit clear. And questions. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, you didn't uh, mention D-Trace uh, for BSD and Solaris. So I, as far as I know, D-Trace doesn't allow you to inject any system calls. So you, you can't change stuff and inject code. But it, it's nice for, for logging stuff, I agree. But this is a, a different use case. Real question. Hi, uh, this is really amazing what you have done. And uh, I have just one question. It is, okay, it's very funny that you should mention a SOX5 application because I am right now actually working on a update to the Debian package of Dante, the SOX server client and so on. And I'm just wondering, uh, have you looked at possibilities of uh, using Tracy as an LD preloaded library to trace the same process. Uh, I mean, from a very quick uh, search that I did just now, it seems that it is uh, kind of funny to get Linux to use ptrace on a different thread in the same process. Uh, have you uh, examined that? Is there, a, have you come across a valid use case for that, obviously? I'm not sure if I completely got your question. Uh, the question was... So, about LDP load, but that's not completely clear. Okay, well, um, from what I understand so far, uh, you are using Tracy on a new process, on a different process. Have you tried, have you looked into using it on a different thread in the same process? I get, okay, I understand it. No, I haven't, but it's a really good idea, actually. I like it. Uh, so what you want to do is you want to take a Tracy application or library and inject it and then uh, run that code and then, like, infect the process from within. The problem is that you definitely need to create a new process because if you want to trace your own process, then you're effectively tracing yourself which means that we'll also be blocking on our own system calls, and if we're blocking on our own system calls, we can't tell ourselves to continue. So then we'll have to wait indefinitely, and, 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 and that doesn't work. So you can't actually trace yourself as a process. But if you spawn a new thread, then you can say, okay, I, I want to trace, you, uh, uh, I wanna trace my, my parent, and that, that works. Uh, my question is uh, kind of similar. If you want to cook system calls, as with uh, and modified behavior, how does uh, Compared to okay, so what you can do with other preload is you can um, take any kind of library function that exists. For example, in libc, there's lots of ones that are named like system calls. For example, open, read, write, and stuff. There are some different parameters, but the end result is the same, which is that some system calls executed. But you can also use other preload for libraries that are not default or that are not even using uh, system calls. And Tracy is just working on a system call level, so it's a very low level. And the main reason to use Tracy over other preload in this case is if you want to be absolutely sure that every system called is executed is actually, uh, that you control everything that is being executed. So the advantages are... What are the advantages? So the advantages are that uh, other preload is not safe. So if you want to write a, a jail or you want to proxify everything, then other preload simply doesn't cut it. So if you have this program and you want to run everything over Tor, um, Tor is an anonymizing network, and you can use it via SOX5 proxy. Um, then you can't be sure if you're using other preload that everything is going over Tor. And if you want to 
anonymize an a program entirely, then you have to do it on system call level. Because if, the, if a program executes some code, uh, so if a program executes some code. Sorry, I got it. I, I understand. OK, so very basically, um, if, you wanna, uh, if you want to perform a system call, you usually use glibc, which is the, the C library to, to uh, interact with the kernel and do other stuff. That will call some assembly code that will uh, uh, perform a uh, system call instruction. The, the, the code that will jump to the system construction is libc code, and LD preload will override that part. What you will do with Trace is you will look at the next part. Uh, and you can avoid LD preload by writing your own inline assembly, which will just do a system call, which means that the jump to a libc function is never executed. So then you can't hook that part. And Tracy allows you to do it on a lower level. Do you have a question? So you mentioned some of the problems uh, with tracing the children's phone by the fork system call. What about the clone system call? All right, so the clone system call is uh, a bit harder because with the clone, our fork is simple. You give it no arguments and it creates a new process. If you use clone, then you can give lots of different options like, okay, so I don't want to share memory, I don't want to share my, uh, uh, like my file descriptor table and other stuff. And it, you can also give clone a, 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 an instruction to jump to, but that's actually only in, in, in libc. So the case is actually very similar. So what we done with safe fork is actually the same for uh, clone. So clone can create processes in a different way, but it will still start executing at the same instruction, uh, which is the instruction after the clone system call, and then we can still capture it. And then whatever happens afterwards is not a, not a problem. Uh, for example, glibc will allow uh, the clone system call to jump to another instruction or to some point in your program, but the, actually the Linux system call doesn't do it. So it's something libc hacks around it. So it's not a problem for us. Uh, one more question. First come, first serve. I was thinking about um, when you catch a uh, Cisco to kind of send it over the network to uh, something like a GDB server when you debug remotely. Uh, did you think about this? Uh, Are you asking if it's similar or? No, have you thought about um, making a plugin system for this talk? You can actually. Ah, right. No, no, it. I haven't. But it's uh, another very nice idea. Thank you. Okay, let's thank Merlin.